Hello, everybody. My name is Kinley Sweet. I am the Director of Digital Marketing at BIS. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for our webinar on how to identify and protect you and your business from online scams. Um, again, thank you to the Biloxi Bay Area Chamber for hosting this with us today and Tina as well. I do want to go over a few things before I introduce our future presenter. We um, do have a question box on the right, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, we will try to get to them during the presentation. If not, we will answer all of them at the end if you want to just answer those in the question box. Also, we do have a great offer for you guys that um, Philip, our feature presenter, will talk about um, at the end of the presentation, so stay tuned for that. And so our feature presenter today is Mr. Philip Long. Philip is a technologist and entrepreneur who specializes in providing technology solutions and security consulting to businesses along the Gulf Coast. He has worked in the IT industry for over 20 years and he has worked with 600 plus clients from Gulfport all the way to Gulf Breeze. He currently owns five businesses and he is a certified information system security professional thank you phila for speaking today great glad to be here and uh, i want to go ahead and just jump right in um, and you know one of the you know the topic of course of today's conversation is going to be about protecting ourselves from online criminals ultimately and how to stay safe you know they say that one in five businesses as a rule uh, get attacked each year. So, you know, you, if you do the math on that, if you uh, remain in business for five years, you're going to experience some form of attack. Now, of course, the low-hanging fruit, people who aren't doing what they need to be doing are going to be hit at a much higher rate than that. It's going to skew the numbers for the people who are doing it right. But in general, we need to have a, a conversation about not about what if, but when if. And so we want to talk about the ways that these cyber criminals are coming in and attacking us. And really, if you were to look at it, uh, by and large, we're going to have social media, emails being the largest, and then web pages. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, a lot of this is happening through what we call phishing emails. Used to be I had to pause and explain what that is, but we know very much what it is. And these phishing kits that can be uh, crowdsourced, basically gotten from other people uh, offline, they're pretty, you know, they work well. And, you know, you could put a junior high boy in, in uh, with a few minutes of reading and he could make himself a professional uh, phishing email scammer. And then we're going to talk a little bit about business email compromise, which is a really a growing trend that we're seeing. And then uh, the delivery mechanism for each one of these, as well as the online, uh, you know, like website links and everything, is they're trying to get a malicious software onto your machine, which we call in general just malware. All right, by the stats here, if we look here, we look at the ICC, and in 2019, they recorded 23,775 complaints about that business email compromise that I spoke of early, earlier, and that resulted in $3.5 billion in losses. That is just in 2019. So this is a very uh, lucrative and a very... Um, a very big uh, crime that's going on throughout the world today, and uh, it's it's not shrinking; it's expanding. Uh, in, in 2019, just phishing emails alone increased by 65 percent, and phishing is the number one of uh, reported cyber crime. And I'll make mention there about the reported. Uh, the reporting of cybercrime is that it really goes largely unreported. So any numbers that we're talking about here are uh, not not really relative in you know in essence to what's really going on in the marketplace. Uh, and that again, that business email compromise is the number five reported cybercrime. So. Uh, and this is actually, you know, phishing itself is just an attempt sometimes, but the actual business email compromise is, is an actual 
uh, as a win for the bad guys. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, a little bit uh, later in the presentation. So let's talk about really uh, some types of phishing email attacks that we're seeing in the marketplace. One is what's called the man in the middle phishing email attack. And with that, uh, this is one that is very effective because what happens is the attacker sends an email to a victim and the victim clicks on a link or goes to a phishing website. And then the uh, attacker is actually sending them not to the actual site, but a site that looks like the actual site, and they grab their credentials. They get their username and their password, and then they pass them on to the legitimate website. And to the victim, they really are not the wiser as to what happened, but now the attacker has the credentials to that particular website. And this would be done even on like an Office 365 web portal so that they can get and start watching emails and all the rest. So when we look at uh, a little more of a breakdown of, of spear phishing attacks, we can see that uh, business email compromise is only 6% of the mail. And then another 11% is what they call sextortion, which is something, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people, I've had clients come to me all nervous about uh, something and said, yeah, you know, they sent me an email and said that they were, uh, they had turned on my video camera and they were watching me. And if I don't send them some Bitcoin or if I don't send them some Apple uh, credit card information, you know, like uh, iTunes account, you know, with money on it, they're going to report it to all of my contacts. And that's a form of really just a scam to get you to be afraid and then to send them money. And then ultimately others are brand impersonations where we'll see, you know, something come in, say from, um, you know, something like, um, you know, Google or, uh, Amazon or UPS or, you know, the like like that, maybe your bank, and they're basically trying to trick you to think that someone that you are doing business with or you have a relationship with is uh, sending you an email and they're trying to, again, ultimately get you to click on something so they could steal your credentials, download a piece of malicious software on your uh, laptop, desktop, and the like. So I want to jump in and talk a little bit about business email compromise because this is something as a business owner that you need to be uh, aware of and you really need to be prepared for. And there's a lot of things that is, that is, uh, that's going on with this. So let's talk about what is business email compromise. And really it's uh, the bad guys, the cyber criminal, they gain access to your business email account and they will basically impersonate you or they'll replicate your, excuse me, your identity in order to deceive other folks, possibly within your organization, uh, you know, within your staff, your employees, or even clients or associates. And, you know, earlier, I think we were at like 2.9 billion in 2019 and 2018, uh, it was 1.5 billion was done. So again, we see this is you know doubling every year. This is a huge uh, compromise that we're seeing within the marketplace. And basically how it happens is uh, an employee email account is compromised by the cyber criminal and that account is used to notify suppliers, customers, friends, employees, whatever of a change uh, uh, to the invoice payment detail or something like that, you know, some way that would say, hey, um, instead of paying here, pay there, or hey, I need you to go get some some Lowe's or Home Depot credit cards and go uh, give me the give me the numbers because I've got to make a transaction because I'm out of town. And they'll watch like the owners uh, or the whoever owns this email account. They'll watch their social media page to know that they're out of town, and then boom, they'll act. And ultimately, that person transfers payment to the cyber criminal's attack. And then that cyber criminal ultimately receives the money and it's done in such a way uh, with bank accounts that are overseas and things where there's a lot more, um, a lot more really corruption at the end of the day is I believe the proper word that are happening within uh, some of these banks. So there's a lot of different types. There's the false invoice scam where they're just basically going to send you a false invoice 
and uh, you're going to pay it. Maybe they're going to send that to your financial person. Uh, there's also the CEO fraud where they're going to impersonate the CEO and they're going to want, um, maybe they're going to send that to the inside person, uh, the CFO, and say, hey, I need you to wire some money here. Uh, and you know, they're doing it from the actual email account of the CEO. So the CFO really is none the wiser and they send the money and poof, it's gone. Another is where they're ultimately um, using that to uh, request invoice payments to sellers and things of the like, so that, uh, you know, they may, we're updating our ACH. So here's the, uh, the proper place that you're supposed to send uh, the money to now, please, you know, update your records and quit wiring the money or ACH in the money into this account, uh, ACH it into ultimately what is the bad guys account, and they, they move forward from there. Another thing they're doing is where they'll do like an attorney or a lawyer, you know, they'll do something where they mimic them and they're going to um, send you information about some sensitive matter that's going on out there and they're going to then maybe get you to email or call and um, they, you know, a lot of different ways that they're going to try to impersonate something like you've gotten yourself, you know, in a bind, like an attorney's coming after you and then you're going to have to uh, do something um, to ultimately, you know, pay them, you know, do something to get them, those guys to protect you. They even may even get you to call them or the like. So uh, the key point on this really is education because uh, at the end of the day, these types of scams are very difficult for people to, uh, to stop, uh, especially if they're sent out in very small batches, you know, like what we call targeted phishing, where they're spear phishing or, you know, it's very targeted to a particular group of people. It's a small amount of email that come out. And again, if they're sending off of your own account, uh, it's, you know, there's, you send email all day long and it's not marked as spam. And the way spam filters ultimately work is whenever there's a, either email coming from a new IP address or there's something, you know, different about that particular email, you know, bad links or something like that. But uh, a fake invoice is the number one type of phishing email sent out. And ultimately because you react, they want that reaction. They're like, whoa, I didn't buy that at iTunes. What's going on? Click for a refund, boom. Uh, they may drop a, you know, some form of, uh, of what we call persistent threat, a piece of malicious software that can just quietly live on that machine until a later date to actually be activated or it could open up a back door on the machine and the like. Some ways that you can identify is that uh, you, know, you can see this from addresses from Philip Long, but ultimately the address is nceo911 at neighbor.com. So you know, that really doesn't match. If you know, of course, I don't own a company called neighbor.com. So you'll, if you notice the, the from, I could put anybody's name. I could put you know, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, or whatever coming from there. So you want to look at the actual email that it's coming from. A couple other things that you want to look at is, uh, you know, send in from an iPad or something like that. You, that may be something that, tick, you know, kind of tips you off that, hey, you know, he don't have an iPad or he never sends email from iPad, stuff like that. And, you know, or, hey, he always has a, uh, a real email signature in his email. A couple others is uh, misspellings. You want to look for misspelled words. You want to look for generic greetings with no specific name because they may have your email address, but they don't actually know what your name is. A couple is uh, what they call the, uh, the double barrel, where they're going to send a couple emails in a row, and they're going to kind of lure you in or make you lower your guard, especially on the second email. Hey, Jack, I'm about to jump on a flight. Just let, uh, let you know that I'll be uh, sending you a file when I land or get Wi-Fi. And then later, they're going to come back with another. Hey, Jack, thanks for your patience. Attach this file I need to review. Thanks for your help. And that file may actually have something in it that is um, malicious. You know, again, they're trying to get some piece of software on your machine in a lot of these cases. A couple of uh, social media scams, that's another one that's going on, 
is that uh, of those approached by scammers on social media, 91% of people engaged. And that's where they may send you a, uh, you know, a uh, request from a friend. And, you know, maybe that friend's account has been hacked and now they're uh, engaging you uh, to, you know, engaging you and they're going to tell you about some kind of a, a fund that you've got to uh, sign up for. There's some free money basically out there and you got to jump through some hoops of which you got to, for them to help you get all signed up and get your money faster, you send them a couple few hundred dollars and that'll, that'll grease the skids and make it happen. But the engagement on that platform uh, because I guess it's such a social platform and people really have their guards down is very great. So these type scams go a long ways because people are engaged. Another one is in the last five years, uh, there's been more than 1.3 billion users um, have compromised, making up one third of all of the social media users. So basically about a third of social media users over the last five years have had some form of compromise uh, within their social media platforms. That could be Facebook, you know, Google, um, you know, Pinterest, you know, all the like, and there's literally probably a hundred of them now out there. Another one, uh, this is also coming from the ICC, where on social media related complaints in 2019 alone, $78 million in losses. So not in the billions like the business email compromise, but still a significant amount of money uh, has, has changed hands uh, from the bad guys on these social media platforms. And of course, the most popular social media platform is still Facebook, and that is the one that uh, the scammers use the most. But I'm telling you, that's going to be a changing and a moving target because, you know, Facebook is kind of slowing down and, you know, Instagram is moving up. So you really need to have your guard up across all platforms. Okay, let's talk about a particular threat of how someone is going to follow what you know what's the path that these bad actors are going to follow well step one is going to be some form of manipulation they are going to try to get you to ultimately click they want you to click they want you to uh, you know possibly give up your information but ultimately they're trying to do something to have you engage with them in some way with a click or filling out a form and the like. And then ultimately, they're going to drop some piece of malware on your machine. And this malicious wares is, of course, the generic term, but there is all types of um, ways that this malicious software can hurt you. It can, again, one of the most effective is, uh, uh, has been around for probably starting the banking industry called Emotet. And it was a, a very small piece of software that was in all regards uh, benign. It didn't have malicious intent, but ultimately it scheduled a task using the Microsoft scheduler and then it downloaded a text file and the like. And some of these things are literally 13 and 14 layers deep of things that they do behind the scenes on your machine using Microsoft components, you know, that are not viewed as malicious to most endpoint security like, you know, Symantec and, and Trend Micro. They're not seeing this as a malicious something because they see it as Microsoft doing tasks within it. But ultimately they're building a bomb on your machine that will at some point uh, go off and either encrypt your files or seal your data or give someone remote access or you know, capture all your uh, usernames and passwords and the like. So what to look out for on social media? Really, you gotta watch out for surveys, quizzes, fake news articles, suspicious messages, because what they're doing with these things is um, they're trying to either A, get you to click on something that's going to put the malicious software on your machine like I 
uh, expressed earlier, but even to gather information, they may be asking you questions that are likely to be your uh, secondary security answers, like for your bank account, where they'll ask you, what town did you meet your wife in? And, uh, you know, what's the name of your dog? And again, it's just collecting data points on you to be used against you in a malicious manner. All right, let's talk about Microsoft uh, 365 uh, in particular. It is one of the fastest rising areas of threat. And although Microsoft really has done a much better job of securing its platform, uh, but by definition or by default, I should say, these settings are not secure. They, uh, they're turned off, like the security features are largely turned off and you need to have somebody with some security expertise to go in there and set it up uh, correctly from a security standpoint. So if we're looking at some of the ways that um, the, you know, the, the hackers are targeting us using the cloud, ultimately again, starts with an email. User clicks, they hit, uh, they hit this phishing kit that email is now compromised. The scammer analyzes the emails and looks for financial transactions. They're looking for some way to monitorize the, uh, basically what they've caught. And then they want to send direct payments to their account. And ultimately they're gonna steal email contacts so they can hit the next target. It's, a, it's an evolution or a, it's a cycle that is never ending with these types of things. So let's talk about some steps that you need to do if you have been hacked. Number one, you need to report it. Number two, you need to change your passwords immediately. Number three, you need to freeze your credit accounts. You need to, you know, if you're running a product like, you know, LifeLock or ID Shield or something, you can simply uh, go on the web portal and you can lock out your accounts so that people can't get to them. And then you want to run a full scan on your systems with more than just like a free antivirus or something. Uh, there's some products out there that are really good at doing a deep scan and looking for some of those, uh, it lays traps and looking for some of those uh, threats that uh, there's behavioral type threats that I spoke of earlier in the building of that bomb that in and of themselves look very benign and not, uh, not malicious. So let's talk about reporting it. Here's some things and you guys can, can look over here. Uh, you know, we're gonna uh, pass out this, this report, but here is the actual websites and the phone numbers where you need to report things. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission is one. Uh, another one is the US CERT. And then also IC3.gov, that's one of the uh, internet crime complaint centers. It's a major place that you wanna be. And then of course the uh, SSA, the Social Security Administration, uh, if you've had your Social Security number or in some way having been frauded uh, that way. You can also, we could throw up there FBI. FBI has local branches within the uh, local marketplace. And I think that could be uh, you know, it's a good place. And the cool thing about FBI, and, I'll say why, you know, I spoke about it earlier. Why is it that a lot of these um, crimes go unannounced is because, or unreported, is because they don't want anybody to know. You know, do you really want to tell somebody, you know, hey, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, our whole system got hacked? Uh, that's just not going to be a, uh, a statement that you're going to want to say. So, uh, and kind of finish up that thought with the FBI, they actually tar pit uh, all the information that you give them and they will not report it to anyone unless they're drug into court to have to represent in some way. Uh, so all that will stay off the legal record unless there's an actual court case that uh, ensues. Uh, number two, change your passwords. You don't want to use the same password and you don't want to use your dog's name or, or common words or anything because there's huge list of passwords out there that the bad actors have that um, they're readily available. You want to uh, make them where, they, where you're using symbols and letters and, and uh, uh, capitals and things of that nature to in, in, uh, increase the complexity of it so that um, you know people are not able to you know to guess it. You also you know you may want to uh, freeze your credit card accounts is always a, a good thing. I have talked to a lot of people and they actually 
keep their account frozen and basically they have to unlock it whenever somebody needs to run uh you know run credit against it a little more difficult for business owners especially if you're kind of moving and shaking um if you're buying property selling property if you're you know doing things if you have several entities your bank may just come across and and take a look at your account uh look at your credit about once a year and if it's locked you know then they're going to have to call you you know it could be some interruptions uh because you'd be surprised how many times your credit actually get uh you know gets checked uh throughout a year if you're if you're you know dabbling in several things Another one, again, like I said, is perform a full business audit with a deep scan. And there's tools out there that, you know, the guys use that come in and do this remediation whenever there is a threat to make sure that there is not some hidden threat. Like I use that term persistent threat uh, in the, in the uh, past. So let's talk about ways that we can prevent it. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So one of the, the best ways is to train your staff. That is uh, by and large where they can spot a, a scam from a mile away. Uh, and the way to do that is with simulated phishing attacks. And that's basically where you send uh, emails with, that are really safe and it's really just to measure your uh, people's uh, effectiveness in recognizing an attack so that you can send them out for further training or, or do internal further training. And third, you want to look at two-factor authentication where you have it where you know you get it all the time you log into your bank and they send you a text with the code. That is one of the most effective means of actually uh, securing an account and any account that has uh, what I call one to many, where with one username, one password, I have access to many valuable records. You need to have two factor authentication on it because oftentimes uh, usernames are very predictable. A lot of times it's your email address, which is easy to find out what that is, or it could be your first name, dot last name, or first initial, dot, you know, last name. So again, there's naming conventions that would not be difficult from a social engineering standpoint to gather about you. And you know, this is a statistic, I haven't seen an updated one. This is from several years back that 65% of people use the same password across multiple accounts. So again, if I got your, your username, which I could probably guess without many attempts, and if I have your password, which uh, if you know if I get if it gets compromised anywhere and it could be used across a lot of different uh, you know platforms, then boom, you got a, a real risk and two factor will protect you. Uh, proper email filtering. Most threats for the common user are going to come through email, and you need to have what's called advanced threat protection on your email. And finally, you need to have. Um, you know, cyber liability insurance. This is something, you know, when all else fails, you're gonna be able to protect your business and a good policy needs to have several areas of coverage. One is where, you know, ransomware, where they'll pay the ransom. One would be where uh, they'll do, um, like if you lost some of your client's information, they'll do that uh, protection like a LifeLock type service and pay for that. They'll also pay for any downtime after the first hour of, uh, excuse me, after the first eight hours of where you're not working, they'll basically pay what it would have cost you, you know, what you have lost and not been able to operate because your systems were not working. They'll do, um, you know, PR coaching, public relations coaching, so that you say and do the right things. They'll even set up call centers to help. There's about 13 areas of coverage that you need in a good cyber liability insurance policy. So again, just kind of re going over that, you know, proper security training needs to be part of your culture. Uh, simulated phishing attacks, I would say once, twice a month where you're hitting your users uh, this is an example of two-factor authentication. We've all seen it, and there's applications out there that work really well that you just touch a button. You can even get the little, you know, fob like you used to get with the bank. A lot of banks have now gone to with an app, but a little, you know, a little dongle that you push a button, it'll allow you to handle that second factor authentication. And um, 
you know, talked about proper emails where ultimately if you have an email with an unknown type attachment, it'll notify the, uh, the notify you that you had a bad attachment, but it will not deliver it into your mailbox because say that, that email had links in it that were malicious or it had attachments that were malicious and the like. And then, you know, talked about just some of the areas of coverage here that you need to have in a good cyber liability insurance policy. So uh, we are offering for the folks on the call here today, we're offering a special offer uh, of a free cyber security starter pack. And so you say, what's the cyber security starter pack? Well, it's really the core components of getting a baseline within your organization so that you can know what uh, what is going on uh, inside. Most people really don't know where to start, and this is a great starting point. And it includes, we're going to do a network vulnerability scan. We're going to do a backup review. We're going to look at your Office 365. Going to set basically a technology roadmap of, you know, based off these findings to class where your highest risk is and help you you know, develop it. I do that because I've seen so many people get, uh, you know, get schnookered by somebody coming in doing some really big time expensive uh, penetration tests and the like. And not, those are good. But if you don't have a firewall, if you're not, you're running up to date software and all that, you would be much better served in spending your money on the things that uh, basically that report's going to find. And you don't need to run that. Then another area that's really important is the governance, which is basically documents that some of which your staff need to sign. And at the end of the day, if something happens, you want to prove that you were doing your uh, due diligence and you were practicing due care. You know, you looked into this, you're aware of this. And even if your company is not held by regulation, um, there's a, a, a law, it's like case law that is called a prudent person principle. And it would state something like if you're a dentist office and this is the year, you know, 2020, would it be that any dentist would be prudent in having an acceptable use policy so that and your people, uh, you know, on your internet or on your um, computers or whatever uh, to protect yourself uh, from you know, a possible malicious employee that was looking at things. And I could tell a lot of stories where if people would have had this in place, it would have saved them a lot of money in court. Uh, also, report uh, with employee testing, uh, testing scores on how they performed on some of those uh, phishing attacks. We're going to do a phishing email attack, and we'll give you the reports to say, hey, here's your weak links. You need to get these guys some more, um, some more training. So uh, network evaluation, we'll do a dark web scan. We'll look at your Office 365 uh, portal to make sure it's secure. And then finally, we're going to do uh, employee training. And, you know, this really isn't free, what we're talking about. This is a really a gift uh, to, our, uh, to our marketplace, if you will, in trying to help us achieve a higher level of security. And I mean, that's going to cost, you know, twelve, thirteen hundred dollars to pull that off. And ultimately, that is for everyone here on this webinar. And uh, you know, I always kind of go to a slide about, you know, what should I do? Should you take up this? I just want to assure you guys that this is not some kind of a, uh, a push where, um, you know, we're trying to take your money. It's totally free. And to get it, all you need to do is email events at askbis.com. Okay, well guys, that was uh, really, I hope, a good use of our time today. And if you have any uh, further questions or anything that you may want us to do, all you have to do is uh, reach out and you can email this events at askbis.com. And I'd be happy to uh, you know, discuss any concerns or if you'd like to take us up on that uh, free offer, all you have to do is email that and say, hey, and we'll have one of our staff get in and schedule with you 
uh, a time that uh, that works for you. So, all right, guys. So wanted to uh, be very respectful of your time. I appreciate the opportunity. And again, if you have any questions, just let us know. Hope you have a great afternoon.